uh, graphically how the third dimension of uh, Cornelius and Zira initially, uh, how that uh, came about. Uh, because uh, neither the appliances, which were brilliant, nor the costumes, which were highly inventive, uh, and neither one of them melded together before the fact to create a reasonable uh, evolution chimpanzee. Evolu well, evoluted, evol uh, evolutionized. Wow. I evolved, oh, evolved. That's like dive, dove, divin, right? Uh, and that was a combination of uh, the invention of both Kim and myself in the wardrobe department when the costumes were first put on and hitting an idea of how to physicalize the characters because they couldn't just be standing up, and that had never been discussed or thought of, didn't look right. And Frank Schaffner, the director's great generosity in accepting the concept that we arrived at, uh, uh, phys the physicalization, which really is based on Groucho Marx, plus certain uh, things that had to be done to the costume. That's why the full figure is needed to show you how, how it worked. Uh, plus, that once the appliances were on, remember we were, 30, were over 30 years ago, and the brilliance of the, the whole makeup was sort of, sort of astonishing, but it was dead. And the way that some life was brought to that is that mercifully both Kim and myself have agile face muscles and you can do this. Yeah. And underneath the appliance all the time we were doing this. As we, so you were working on two tracks. You know the, the actor's intent toward the other actor plus just the basic mechanical uh, thing of doing this. Now, when this is, looks so ridiculous and so severe, sitting here doing that, but that much actually brought a given life to the uh, appliance, so it was just not sitting dead on your face. And also found ways of, of uh, <laughs> the breathing channel was through the upper lip. And if you took the snout and pushed it together so, and blew into it, the whole piece would, you had to be very careful how you did because you could blow it off. But uh, I mean, so technical, in moments of, of given anger, so and so, do that, and the entire, uh, it looked like the whole skin was expanding. Like, like, actually getting red with anger, but your face was, the appliance was uh, bloating a little. And things like that gave this added a dimension to the believability, which uh, coupled with the appliances made quite an original statement. The physical, but when we come to doing something outside or whatever with, I can show you physically how the how it was accomplished, how that walk came to be, and how uh, there there was an underpinning that was made to which really I invented, which was a a t-shirt with a hump, because there was no without that, and when the physicalization that there there was no there was Let's see, it looks like the spine starts in here. Right. Uh, but that was done by building up the costume, so it, it wasn't like this, because then it wouldn't have been. So that wasn't part of the original design? That's something that No. No. It stood for hours in front of the thing, what it was. Well, I, but I, I can only show it to you in full figure. Oh, OK. All right. well, maybe, actually, maybe we can, after, after the interview, we can, when you get off the chair, maybe we can just do a little thing. Be interesting to use that in uh, uh, comparatively with the with the 
I don't split the screen and, and use the actual figure. You know, I mean the right. freeze frame. The I don't know uh, the Cornelius. So you can see from. Yeah, because I've been rewatching the films, and that, that was actually going to be one of my questions for you. Was because there there was a, beyond the makeup, there was kind of a whole physical thing that you. That you well, saw, without the you know, ooh, you know, walk, and there was sort of a rolling right. motion to the. Well, all of that when one is full figure can explain, right. because I thought it wouldn't have worked. The other thing was that unless, the reason I asked Frank about it, because it got the giggles, if we did this and nobody else did it, we'd look like horses asses, because uh, everybody had to somehow, to some degree, um, align themselves with that sort of choreography. So did you teach the other actors? This? Well, no, or just, uh, well, once it was, once it was established, or when, uh, there was nothing to t you just show, you know. The uh, was very tiring to do because it um, was very tiring on the legs. Well, I'll show you. Right. Oh. But I mean, did, did, did Schaffner say, "Oh, yeah, that's great"? Now you go show everybody. You and well, I think as we got to individual scenes, or maybe I, I, I don't know the ultimate vocabulary how he transmitted that to to the other chimpanzees. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know those particulars. Well, was there, were there different movements developed for the chimpanzees versus the orangutans versus the gorillas? Well, the orangutans, of course, were much more lumbering. And the gorillas, of course, were just uh, monolithic. But the whole nimble, um, the whole nimble quality of, of the chimpanzees, they're the most uh, uh, more nimble of the, of the group. The orangutan, they were, uh, they were, I, 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 I can't speak for what the, how the situation with the chimpanzees affected the orangutans, if it did, or the, um, or the gorillas, I don't know. I just really know about my chimp. <laughs> now, who did the costume design? Uh, costume design? Um, I forget. I'm not sure. Let's look that up. I mean, they, uh. Uh, uh, the, the costume designer, uh, uh, is the costume designer still alive? Um, I'm not sure. We'll have to, we'll have to research that. I think so. Yeah, because we'll, that. We'll call the office. We can go yeah, that'd be interesting to know. Yeah, now to, to see. What's that? Could you just turn your body a little more towards oh, no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your chair? Okay. Yeah. Hey, Corey, when you stop, let me know, okay? Because i got to stop this other tape. But yeah, I'm still rolling. Okay. okay. Uh, um, Maybe we let's um, kind of go back to the beginning. And, uh, one second. We'll, one we'll, second. We'll set that up. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> do you know about the uh, the evolution, so to speak, of the Apes Project? How did it uh, come about? Well, well, I only know what I know, which is. Uh, Arthur Jacobs was a good friend uh, of mine. Arthur was a very volatile and gregarious fellow with a tr great tenacity. And of course, he'd been a, uh, in PR. And he was known by uh, everybody. So in my life, I forget why, somewhere in the 60s, I was on a plane coming back from London with Arthur. I forget. We weren't traveling together. We just happened to meet up and talked with and he told me about this project and uh, and swore me to secrecy in relation to uh, the end and he said he wanted me to play this this character Cornelius well it did sound absolutely fascinating but uh, I took it not with a grain of salt but uh, it would be great if, th if that happened you know but those, it's, it was so surreal a wonderful idea I thought and it had then been, as far as I know, it had been a project with Warner Brothers. Blake Edwards had it, as I remember. I had not, no, uh, nothing to do with it. I must ask Blake about that, but I don't know what his, have, has anybody asked him about his? We ha uh, well, in the research we found out that he was initially involved uh, to direct it, and then. But at Warner it, Brothers. It, got, it kind of, you know, it, it, I, Jacobs apparently went around to a few studios getting turned down, and eventually Edwards had to drop out of the project. But Blake was involved with Arthur? Mm -hmm. 
But, but I, uh, what I heard, and I know that it, that it uh, had an eight million dollar, six or eight million dollar budget, which of course in those years is comparable to what, eighty million or something, huge amount, and nobody wanted it. And also the uh, uh, luck I would check. I lived in New York then, and come out, and I would always see Arthur because he was such fun, and we shared this demented. Um, uh, um, hobby together. We loved old movies. And this is long before it was the craze or possible to see a material like it is now. It's long before uh, the copyright holder allowed, uh, realized there was money to be uh, gleaned from exhibitions. So all of the, so much of this stuff was unseeable. And we used to get together with a lot of other people and watch the most wonderful things. Um, and Arthur, by virtue of his contacts, had uh, access to incredible footage that was, uh, well, it was like walking through a museum. And we used to have wonderful evenings and argue and uh, play card games that were made up of, uh, we played a gin rummy game that we invented that was all movie stars and making movies. Alan Ladd, Jr., and, and Arthur, and uh, David Chasman were these, we used to go over with these stacks of cards and sit down at parties and play this game. And um, it was fascinating. One time we wanted to market the game with the proceeds going to uh, the Motion Picture Fund, but it was impossible to get clearance approval on all of these uh, various people. And, uh, but it was a good idea. Anyhow, what, as far as I know, um, this was, I, I have no idea of the passage of time, but it was considerable. And I was doing other things, so and, so, and suddenly this did come to pass. Uh, from what I understand, primarily due to uh, the test, finally, that was made by Edward G. Robinson as the orangutan. One of the great uh, things that uh, was negatives from the uh, studios was the fact that Historically, in film, any actor who was just, quote, lost inside makeups, uh, the films had not been uh, viable, whether it be uh, commercially viable. Alice in Wonderland, the great one in the 30s, with, had all the stars, and uh, they were so heavily made up. In uh, another one would be, um, and it was a disastrous failure. I don't think because those, the film just didn't hit the public's fancy. Uh, but there are other films where, outside of Lon Chaney or Boris Karloff, I, the, if a known person was disguised to this degree by makeup, uh, for some reason they, were, they, they thought the projects were unmarketable, uh, unmarketable. Was there also a, a resistance to science fiction at that time? Hmm? In terms of, was there a resistance to producing science fiction at that time? Oh, this is science fiction, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I never think of things in uh, that way. <laughs> Um, no, I don't think so, because certainly uh, in that category, uh, there have been many films that have been very, very successful in, uh, and ones that hadn't been. Just Imagine was a great flop, which was certainly science fiction. Metropolis, which was German, was a big hit in its, in its arena. Uh, I had, had uh, Journey, what's the one with Michael Rennie? Uh, Eight that, that, that was before Apes. Yeah, that was And that was very successful. Forbidden Planet was before Apes, I think, wasn't it? That yeah, was yeah. Uh, successful. So I don't think it was that. I think the resistance was, number one, it was a, a very far out premise. And number two, everybody in it, with the exception of uh, a couple of characters, were apes, chimpanzees, or orangutans. And uh, the, the buyer just looked at the cellar like they were out of their gourd, you know. The Eddie's test proved that a, a personality could register through uh, this sort of dense makeup. And if the actor was intelligent uh, and uh, thoughtful, uh, the, which Robinson certainly was, that uh, intent could register. Well, how, how did you as an actor? Okay. Oh, yeah. Just say, uh, um, Eddie Robinson's gift was phenomenal because he was certainly aware that he could never make the film because 
he, he had a heart condition, and number one, he couldn't be in the altitudes that w might be needed. Number two, to be encased in that sort of uh, armor would be uh, cl claustrophobic. So what he did was phenomenal, because this piece was not uh, viable at all. So much so that it triggered, mercifully, the, um, the fortunes of um, John Heston and Frank Schaffner, because uh, Chuck was such a huge uh, money star then, that it is his uh, agreement to do the film for, I, I, I think, a pittance of a salary uh, that gave it, uh, uh, that floated it in the, uh, in the buyer's mind. And also uh, Frank Schaffner, who did the, well, they made a fortune, God bless them, as well they should have. And Arthur's incredible tenacity. I mean, he never, ever flagged. And it was years of rejection. I was always very good. I don't know why he thought of me for it. I have no idea. Uh, and I was intrigued by the I absolutely intrigued because uh, makeup's always been a fascination of mine and two or three of the best opportunities I've ever had on stage involved heavy, heavy makeup, most of which I did myself. Uh, and I always found that very inventive and really like the green umbrella. I mean, you really di disappeared inside uh, the character. The problem with the first film was I came out, it was all agreed and everything else, and I came out to do the makeup tests. And because I, as I said, I lived in New York then, and I came out for two or three days to do the, uh, the, and they put that stuff on my face, you know, the to take the mask. And in those years, it was not like it is now. I'm slightly claustrophobic, and those straws in your nostrils, and, and I think, oh, get me out of here. Well, when it was all put on, I uh, began to hyperventilate. I mean, I I was really in trouble. And I went back to New York and thought, I can't do this project. I will, I'll die. And then I had a long talk with myself and psyched myself out because I realized the role was, you don't get to do those sort of things. I mean, it's, they don't come along. And the challenge was immense, primarily the challenge of registering through all of this immense disguise and making it a part of oneself, not a foreign situation and how to be a human chimp <laughs> as opposed to you know, being some you know, asinine uh, indicated monkey or something. So I, when I, I, I talked myself into that, and ca but I would really have to psych myself out every time I would go into makeup because you had to get onto a different mind bent or you were in trouble. And I always recognized during the canon that came along when people, because it's kind of a status symbol to be in one of those ultimately, and when people come along and want to do them and suddenly the makeup began to be applied and I could see that the, Sal Minio I thought was going to die when uh, uh, I've never seen, he looked like had these great big wonderful eyes, Sal, and we knew each other very well. And when it was on, he looked like a deer caught in the headlights, you know, I mean, the look of agony. <laughs> and it could be agonizing unless you applied a certain menu of behavior. You could go bananas. Sorry about that. So you as an actor didn't mind going virtually unrecognized in the part. You found it a, to be a challenge. I mean, because you were, you, a lot of actors you would think would be attracted to a part oh. I'm going to be on screen and my face is going to be up there, you know, for 90% of the movie, oh. but you're, you know, you're really, no, you're I'm, on there, but you're... I've, I've really never had those problems. My ego is in another place. It, the fact of not being recognized is only, inside a part, it's only a compliment to me. Uh, that was, with some people, a, a tremendous issue of, of despair. The interesting thing is that, in that sense, during the making of the first film, which, and the content of which was unknown to, uh, on the lot, uh, 
Pente, you are, you are anonymous, you know, and you're going from one spot to another, and p the expression on people's faces, you did feel like you were in a zoo, because people did begin to look and relate to you, uh, this unknown, whatever, uh, <laughs> like you were an animal. And that was very interesting, To I know how those poor things, you know, being po uh, poked at. Uh, there were great larky things to do. I, I remember one time in that, in that full drag and everything else, just walking into an executive meeting. I mean, I just walked into one of the big executive's offices. And it was a <laughs> they were all seated around. They were having some big discussion. I just walked right by the secretary, opened the door, went in and sat down in the room. And everybody stopped. Because, I mean, there was nowhere. I mean, who they didn't know. It was, it was just a chimp had come in, you know. And the, sitting there, this, that. and everybody, nobody wanted to refer, they would have preferred if I was invisible. <laughs> I sit there and, uh, and got up and walked out. <laughs> nobody ever referred to it, it happened. <laughs> Another time, oh, I think, on oh, one of the movies, uh, Julie Andrews was making Star, I guess, the Star, yeah. And we knew each other very well from having done Camelot and very close friends. But uh, nobody was, this is the first movie, so nobody was attuned to the fact of uh, chimpanzees being around. And I remember going onto her set and lying down in front of her portable dressing room, not, you know, knocking on the door. Ah! <laughs> she just. <laughs> so no, I didn't have problems about <laughs> that so, aspect. So did the. Um is it, did that affect the choices of the other actors who played the apes? I mean, finding people that from actors that, you know, like you said, had had an ego in another place. Well, I, number one, I don't th I I don't think that that is known until after the fact. Until one is, it's like that old thing. If you say to an actor, uh, "Oh, listen, can you ride a horse?" Oh, sure, sure, I can ride a horse. But they've never been on one, right? You know, and so they take three quick lessons and go and fall flat on their ass. You know. But the point is you're game for anything, and it isn't until you're in it that you realize the, uh, the problems. And those can have be translated in various ways. On the first film, it wasn't just the appliance that was so difficult to deal with and the unknown, because you were traveling in no man's land, but the heat, because it was made in August. And that was unbelievable. Unbelievable. And out on the Fox Ranch, I mean, it's a, it could be like y you were literally in a temperature of like 130 inside that, and fans, and nothing. Could, and I can remember thinking I was, was certainly verging on senility, because. Uh, when your face is covered, your skin fa uh, on your face it, it absorbs a great deal of the air, you know, uh, oxygen. And when that's shut off, so you can begin really to get dizzy. And in that sort of heat, everything just time and time again thought it was going to faint, you know. They, that was very, and people like Morris Evans, who he was, he was valiant because that was very, very uncomfortable the whole eating problem, all of those things, because none of that had been uh, thought out. Why should it be? It, had, it was an unknown. When, uh, unknown things came along, I certainly didn't realize it. I'm allergic to spirit gum which I didn't really, it's always been uncomfortable, with it, but it was a major, major problem. Now, I mean, it's so many years later, all these uh, sophisticated sort of blues have come along. Liquid adhesive was just coming in, but there was initially, uh, uh, didn't, wa didn't want to use it, I, I, I don't know why, but we ultimately did, because I couldn't, uh, my skin would erupt. And one had to be very careful with the, uh, with the sort of um, adhesives or glues that we use because if you began to, if the skin began to break down, uh, there was no road back. 
And people, Kim Hunter was so brave because her skin was so delicate that putting it on took three and a half hours. Taking it off for her took over an hour. Me, I just go, no, uh, get rid of it. But had to be very careful about this area back in here. And one of the things that was interesting to figure out from the moment they started putting the makeup on, technically you had to understand that from the moment it was coming on, it was coming off. And you had to be very careful about the maintenance during the day. Otherwise, uh, you could be rendered totally useless. And if you began to move, you know, they, uh, and then they would have to go in there with orange sticks and glue. And, uh, it, then it became unbelievably uh, uncomfortable. I never ate past uh, like 7 in the morning until it came off because if the saliva was activated, that was a breaking down agent for around here. And that was very difficult to keep all of those uh, very thin edges, you know, that, that, that they would come together. And you could go crazy with being stuck with glue and so on. Yeah, the whole makeup pit stops. And yeah. And one of the things, though, that you know, actors are so volatile and um, or most of them, gregarious. Once you had uh, that makeup on, it was highly advisable not to speak at all unless it was inside uh, the work at hand, because all of that was an irritant to uh, the preservation of for the day. And people will forget. I remember being in at one time 19 hours, and my nervous system began to uh, break because there was no air. So, so then you didn't have much uh, socializing then with the other actors who were playing the eight? No, because you couldn't really. I'd, uh, lying down in, after the first movie, I wasn't in the second because I was directing a film in England. So I wasn't in the second, but when the third, I, I wouldn't make another one in the summer. Uh, that was just a stipulation. There's no way to think. And uh, it just was Hades. Uh, and then after having done the first film, I did insist that there would be air conditioning, uh, air conditioned trailer to go in and just lie down, to be cool as much as possible between shots. Otherwise, uh, there's a point of no return, and when you get that exhausted, it's dangerous. You know, if you if your whole system is just <sighs> wiped out, you can have accidents. Now, uh, now, who designed the makeup? John Chambers, who was a genius. But that whole crew, I came out after uh, ten years, partly involved with uh, four of the features and the and the television series. I was doing other work too. But one of the great experiences of my life was uh, the heroic behavior of uh, an army of makeup men who had turnaround that were un sometimes they'd be six and seven hours, that's all, and they'd have to be back there doing it again. And it's very, the minutia of it is uh, so extreme. If you make one mistake when you're putting that stuff on, you cause just bleeding agony for the person who's wearing it. If the, if the nose piece goes on, if your nose was twisted inside that, or when the ears go on, if it was, you would be, ex it would be excruciating. There's no way to take it off and start again. So all of that had to uh, be very carefully choreographed by the makeup man, and they were, they were terrific. It's very nerve-wracking. For three and a half hours, you know, putting this stuff on, and then, the the uh, the toupees and then the laying of the individual hairs, you know, over that to disguise it. When I knew, well, the day was over, <laughs> was the moment they put on the hand toupees. I don't know why. That was psychologically, uh, you know, the, to, uh, the it was a full toupee go here, and then it would be taped up under the costume and then laid on with, uh, with glue the, uh, the hairs here. I hated that. I never figured out why. It was like, oh. the, the, 
the guillotine is just about or hated it. But my um, this many years later, of course, when we're the the makeup teams now the it's reached a point where the the sons of the guys who were so many of them on the t on the teams initially, uh, they are now makeup men with children. <laughs> so it's a whole. It's the basis, of course, that movie, and that uh, that experiment devised by uh, Chambers uh, is the is the platform for all of the movies of today. Uh, or uh, it was so adventurous. It was so far out an idea, and it triggered. Uh, all this family of film we have now, nothing would have been possible without what John Chambers uh, put on the table back then. Now, was he, um, would he be there every day putting on makeup with no. the team? Or? Mm -mm, no. Remember, there were, uh, there were hundreds and hundreds of uh, actors involved with this. So, gee, I don't know how many makeup men there were. Uh, it was very specific that the given principal had um, his own individual makeup man because uh, it was really like a, a love affair and they'd be able to, able to do it day after day after day. And of course production was a can't you do it in less time, can't you do it in less time. And it was excruciating for them. You know? I mean, the, the, the coffee nerves were no good. <laughs> so they were a great lot. A lot of jokes. I used to play opera a lot. That that's how I would, and go to sleep. I would go to sleep when uh, a whole part of the makeup I could just sort of sleep. And would the other actors do similar things, like him and Maurice? I don't know. We all have our ways to psych each other into uh, through really impossible situations because it was impossible to sit for three and a half hours and uh, have this done to you, isn't it? It's, uh, it defies the law of common sense in a way. That's what made it so fascinating. Also, the uh, like, if, I guess we'd start like at four in the morning, so then somewhere around six thirty, when all of this part would be on, and uh, uh, before uh, I would eat, then, and then it would then lock so out. That would be the the, the re for, for, the re for the rest of the day. Now, was there? How about interaction between the human actor, the actors playing you, the, the humans and the, the apes? I mean, did you find much, any socialization between like you and Charles Heston or? Well, the thing, when, when one is working with actors of, of the caliber of, uh, both as actors and as human beings, of, uh, like Heston, like Don Murray, Ricardo Montalban, I mean, the elegance and uh, the refinement and the uh, responsibility of, of those fellows is just terrific. So uh, it was grand to be with them. Now, what their reaction was, I don't know. I never asked, really, because, of course, I never felt like I was, quote, a chimpanzee. But then most chimpanzees don't, as far as I, I didn't feel different. Heston told us an interesting story where he observed, you know, at lunch breaks and things like that, where the, the actors playing apes would kind of self-segregate themselves. The gorillas would eat with the gorillas, oh, really? <laughs> the chimps would hang with the chimps, and they rang it, you know, and that there was, it was within the apes, just as in the film, there was sort of the segregation going on that was... See, I used to go and, uh, I used to go and lie down, because, uh, but I, whether I'm, I usually do at lunch anyway in order to get second wind, so... That experience, except for a couple of times, they didn't. Have, a lot of them used to eat with chopsticks, you know. And they, uh, but that seemed that didn't. None of that worked for me. I'd rather just uh, flake out. But those. One of the important things, I guess, thinking about the architectures of, uh, was just to behave normally. Chimp toward. I mean, not think that you. Uh, well, because that's one of the great messages in, in the films, that uh, uh, just because you're a different color or uh, a different race doesn't mean that you uh, are any different from each other. But, so that's the same thing in relation to playing the role. One thing was uh, 
intriguing is there was a big courtroom scene. What, which film? Was that the first film? No, the third. Big courtroom scene. Uh, with Kim and myself being interrogated. Right. And <coughs> Don Taylor directed. Did you contact Don Taylor? Did you, you didn't find him? No, we actually, we didn't. We had to trim our list down, so he, he's a backup. Because the directors are uh, really, and there are only, there are only two of them left, right? But they are such David a... Tops, yeah. We got a hold of him. He's yeah. To talk to us. They are so valuable because they had to deal with all of this insanity, you know. Uh, we were doing this big courtroom scene, and, uh, you know, like they were shooting, they shot Kim and myself, all the angle there. Then they came behind, and they did the interrogating. That wonderful actor who's in so good in soap opera. Uh, John Randolph. Uh, no, not John. He's a steady Eric Brady. What's his name? Eric Braden. Eric Braden. What, he's wonderful in that film. Uh, so intelligent and uh, really terrific to work with. When they came around to shoot the interrogating committee, we were permitted to take off uh, the makeup, which was a great relief, you know, and just spend the rest of the day uh, doing, you know, feeding. Well, the thing is, after you've played the, for hours, the reverse, and you've been doing, you know, all this, and, and you know, because it's a whole different acting uh, style, it's a whole different, uh, to get it all through. Suddenly you're without makeup, and you begin doing this because it's ingrained somehow into the, uh, into the grid. Felt like a goddamn fool, you know, and you had to walk there because it was disgraceful. <laughs> I've never, I've never asked. It's funny. I must ask Chuck and and uh, uh, Don how it was to deal with, especially in the initial film, to deal with these. I mean, what they went home and tell their wife. I've been working with chimpanzees, you know. I mean, Interesting. I never thought. I never really thought about that. So, so beyond the makeup, obviously there were the character and the story must have attracted you in, in some ways. I mean, do you recall the the script uh, evolution? How that? Uh, who worked on it? I I, re I recall my um, my emotional emotional response to the material, which was uh, I, I I thought it was awesome, and. One of the reasons I feel so attached to the canon is because what they were ultimately saying is so compassionate and, and so moving and dramatic, as one the, and, and in many cases so dear. And I think it was one of the reasons that captured the imagination of children to such an immense degree. And I think it's a huge mistake and uh, really unthinking that uh, the various managements for the past three decades have not made more of these of the of this uh, of this series would, well, I was saying that I, would you be adverse if we had you take your shoes off you sound so this way you can still hear me <laughs> oh my god you didn't dart <laughs> by sandy dennis <laughs> Uh, so what what did you think the the mess what was the message of the film or what what were the, the well I, for me to get my interpretation of the is merely my interpretation and it can be pomp everybody has an individual impact about that material that is very personal it's why it uh, just so embraced uh, across the world and it's very individual I loved. In a strange way, the ca the ca I played three different characters during the passage of all the projects. And uh, Cornelius, who was so intellectual uh, and so <laughs> wonderfully dealt with by Kim Hunter as the why. I mean, the wonderful sort of humor she had about Cornelius, which was adorable. She's a wonderful actress. But then playing my own son in the fourth and the fifth films uh, was a great acting release from Cornelius in a way because it was no holes barred. I 
took much more from the character of my mother, uh, uh, Zira, in passion uh, than from Cornelius in mixing up the ingredients of, uh, of uh, Caesar. And in the fourth film, that's a great, great role. That's a very difficult, uh, very volatile part, wonderful. But my favorite character in, in, of the whole group to play was Galen in the um, television series because <laughs> he had nothing to do at all with the other characters. And he was so larky, uh, uh, full of the devil and uh, full of invention. That was a great character to play. And I love the series, and I think the series is not bitter, but uh, very resigned to uh, big business going to work, uh, network business at the time, to really do that series in. And a lot of people would disagree with that, but that is the bottom line. That series was extremely good, and on its way in development to being terrific. So. Um, where were we? <laughs> <laughs> well, we were. Well, I had asked you what you thought the the time or what what themes you thought were brought out in in, in Planet of the Apes and, and what writers. Oh, I think no, that can. Oh, uh, that, that could get to be so pompous, you know. And then but it's interesting to hear, even the, though it's your philosophy. I, the uh, writer, the Paul Dane, uh, who wrote the, the the first was Rod, was it Rod yeah. Rod Serling, and uh, which is a remarkable piece, but Paul D E H N who's dead now. I think he was terrific, just terrific. And he, in the sequels, he didn't write the last, I don't think. God, I get confused. No, he did not write the last one. Um, he had such a grasp of, of, uh, of the surreal, the surreal world. And he, and he was a very good writer and full of wit. There's been a tendency, you know, there always is in uh, that a lot of people become so, so fanatic about uh, the series that they sometimes people say, well, now this one followed here, and, and I said, stop a minute. I don't know which one is which, really. And it isn't taking a straight line through. You know, everybody's trying to justify the reason for this one getting, they are what they are, and they're all very good. Uh, one really doesn't have to. What is it necessary to pontificate? They each stand on their own base, I think. Well, do you recall who came up, who came up with the ending for the first, no. first film? No. To you? Uh, we've heard that it was a couple of versions. One version is that I think it was, I think it was Blake Edwards and uh, Arthur were having lunch, supposedly in a deli across from Warner Brothers, and there was a, a picture of the Statue of Liberty, and one of them was, yeah, that, that's our ending, you know, sort of a thing. Really? Yeah, that's one story. And then another story was that uh, it's also been attributed to Serling that it was in an early draft of, of one of his. All I know about that is that I knew about it on the airplane and was sworn to secrecy and understandably because, I mean, it was a mind blower, absolute mind blower. I think the filmmaking in the initial film is astonishing. And uh, I can't understand why uh, 20th Century Fox hasn't restored and re-released it on a big screen because it's a fantastic production. And I think, and there's a whole generation, I mean, they can say as much as they want, oh, well, you know, it's on television all the time. <laughs> That's a postage stamp as opposed to a huge widescreen experience. And it, that has been proven in recent years uh, to be perfectly valid. In, putting old material back on the screen in its original gigantic form, and it's overwhelming. And not only to a new generation who have not seen it in that form, but to the old generation who have seen it but have forgotten, because it's like going back to an opera. Uh, uh, it's familiar material, but absolutely mind-boggling. And the filmmaking is so damn good. When when those guys, the astronauts, that moment in the film, hear, and then the audience suddenly sees what they're hearing, which are these gorillas on horseback, and the ah, well, it's wonderful. It's just wonderful filmmaking. He was very good, Schaffner, very, very good. 
that, yeah, actually, I was going to say that brings us to, to sort of a discussion of Schaffner and what kind of a director he was and how he would he was on the set and, and how did he and Jacobs work together? I mean, you know, what was that relationship? Was Jacobs involved on the on the set? Or Arthur did do his thing? Arthur was obstreperous. Arthur could not not be involved with everything, you know. The, and, uh, you know, sometimes it was like, because <laughs> he was irrepressible, and it was part of his appeal. And sometimes they said, would you go to your room? You know, and they, you've been up too long. You know, they, uh, but he was always a, uh, a supportive and uh, encouraging force. And that enthusiasm was irresistible. Frank was so low-key. Frank was a very... You know, great, great, great gentleman. I never ever saw him out of sorts or uh, or unkind, and it must have been. I mean, it was no man's land. It was such a new territory to be in. It must have been devastating to have to direct that film. You, number one, you do, how could you tell one chimpanzee from another or one orang? You know, you didn't know who you were talking to half the time. The logistics were uh, very difficult. I mean. <laughs> I think, yeah, I've got footage of it, you know, the idea of how to cut down time, because the film was very expensive. I, what did it cost? The third, do you know? Uh, 5.8. Well, that's gigantic. A Poseidon Adventure cost two, which was considered to be, and nobody wanted it. I mean, they kept canceling it. But that cost $2 million, and that was considered so excessive. Uh, well, Apes was like five million, a huge amount of money. And they kept trying to figure ways to cut down, you know. To, and the makeup situation was, of course, uh, outlandish to the unjudicious. Outlandish. Uh, so they tried to, well, if we put the makeup in, on in the studio, no, we'll put them on in, we'll take them out to location. So then uh, there were all these problems. Then the idea, make them up in the studio and take them in cars. Well. It's before the fact of any public knowing that uh, there was such a thing going on. So if you could be on the freeway or, you know, and another car next to you looking and seeing a chimpanzee sitting in the front seat, you know, <laughs> you could, that could cause a little bit of disturbance to the... Then the next idea was to, I, th I think this is in this order, to make us up and take us by helicopter to Trancus. And I've got a huge amount of footage of that, you know, flying over Los Angeles and it's like, oh, it's wonderful. Um, then going there and being without makeup and being made up. All these variations to try and cut down. The, ultimately, of course, the thing was you couldn't cut down the makeup time. That was, they were working like Trojans and that was the, the time that was needed in order to uh, complete the task. There were, now, Frank had to deal with all of these unknown problems. He was like general of the army. I never once saw him out of sorts. Never once saw him unkind. He was a f I, I never spoke to him about it, but because uh, I felt I, I felt like something was breaking down in my system in, on the first film because I would get dizzy, you know, and and, uh, and sometimes I must have been very difficult to connect with. I remember one day him saying to me, is everything all right? Because I was, well, it wasn't all right. I couldn't remember a line. And uh, it was all it was, was, I guess, heat prostration. <laughs> I don't know, just something casual like that. But he, he never um, chastised or... He was a lovely man to work with. Lovely. And you felt that he was in there, control on the set? When you were first talking about the director, there was a siren. We like that siren. Okay. <laughs> when you talk about the helicopter, there was someone. Oh uh, uh, yeah, that. Okay. Jim, that rumbling, that's basically just traffic, right? That's no, that's my brain. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the room. There's not. There's some. I mean, there's something there. I mean, yeah, it's tunnel right now, but you can't. If you hear anything from outside, we, we could put mattresses and bunkers. No, it's not from outside. It's from it's the actual building. I don't oh, know. It's as we talk, as things come back, I I do remember one of the things that I could not deal with was unnecessary noise. And 
and lack of decision because that ate up energy and Frank was never Frank was absolutely extraordinary in knowing what he wanted and that strikes me as so valiant because again it was this unknown territory I loved uh, uh, J. Lee Thompson he had such an incredible sense of humor like a like a little English schoolboy I mean uh, and a very good filmmaker but a, a delicious sense of humor which took up a lot of the slack in relation to tension and I know when we were doing the series there was one director who was neither organized uh, he hadn't done his homework and he couldn't control his set and that was agonizing because noise makes you very tired if it's a din yeah, that's right, because that's one of the Nazi torches, wasn't it? Was to play loud, loud you know, play loud music, right? Yeah. Uh, it figures. <laughs> that's a good one. And the um, that used to drive me crazy because uh, one is so confined inside that situation, and you know, at least I know, when you have a physical situation that well, when you're encased. You've got to be able to know, like a racehorse, how long the track is. And I never, uh, I used to get upset if I would ask a sister director, how, what is the outside time do you think we will be through? I wasn't ask, asking it to go home, I was asking it to know in relation to my energies. And if you got, you know, a, a, I don't know, recalcitrant assistant, then you, there would be all this garbage, you know. So, said, well, you know, I'm waffling. I said, just, it's better to know the worst, you know, than, and then if it's, if it's three hours earlier, how great, but to know the worst. Because there, there was a tendency in shooting to, um, as the days, you know, the 12-hour day, and then it's extended, so it's suddenly 14 or 15 hours, then you start later the next day, and so on and so forth. Uh, and you get into hours that where everybody is like this, the crew, everybody is uh, at their wit's end because they're exhausted. Do you recall if the, um, because of all those factors with the makeup, um, eating up so much of the budget and the time, did that affect the design of the, the, the other the design, ele design elements of the other aspects of the film? You know, the, the oh. sort of view of the society, how the, how the how the society was. I thought, it's a, uh, I thought the design of the film was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And uh, whatever it cost, I mean, I don't know, but it, that was an in, entirely original concept. That amphitheater and the, uh, uh, where in the first film, it's just terrific, the whole town. It's just wonderful. Uh, the invention and simplicity of it all, and the, uh, I don't, I mix them all up, the, the, the hall where uh, Zaius, uh, that's, I mean, it's, it's beautiful to look at, beautiful and, and weird, and of course one of the great lighting cameramen of all time did the first film, uh, Leon Shamroy, Grumble Guts. <laughs> I mean, we'd worked together, I mean, since I was a kid. He did Cleopatra, he did, uh, well, he was simply a great, gr Leon Shamroy was the man at the end of the Black Swan with uh, Tyrone Paramore and O'Hara, the, the great sky, the, you know, the, the great backdrop with a sunset. That isn't backdrop at all, that's all light. He painted with, uh, I watched him one time light the throne room in Cleopatra, which was just, Three flats, I mean, granted, all frescoed and so on, but uh, was nothing. And what he took like six or seven hours to light it, and it was ha, stunning, like a great, great painting. So, in that sense, the film had uh, great technicians, uh, wonderful design, and everybody on the line was absolutely uh, galvanized with interest, because it was something that had never been done. It was really entering into the unexpected. The, uh, I mean, do you recall then when kind of seeing the film with an audience and when it came out, what the, the public reaction was and the critical reaction? I saw it for the first time in a projection room in New York. 
showing, and uh, which is uh, that's a very prejudiced area. I mean, to see, uh, I don't know if I've ever seen it in 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 a in a, a regular theater. I don't know if I have. Uh, that's a very well. I said that, that's a very prejudiced area, and and uh, of of audience attention. And once you've been in a film, you don't when you you don't have the same reaction to the end product as uh, as if you're seeing it. You've had nothing to do with it, because uh, after all, you you know the end, honey, <laughs> and you know you, you and also you're watching. I mean, this this is uh, this goes for films I made when I was 12, 13 years old. When I go see them, I can remember uh, what I was thinking in given scenes. Actually, it's like a déjà vu. So you're not seeing just the entertainment; you're seeing a whole uh, complexity of your involvement, etc., uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And so my reaction as an audience is technical; it's not uh, it's not visceral. Uh, and I think with, I think I I just know it's a wonderfully made movie. Do you recall if the success of it built slowly, or did it come out as sort of a you know gotta see it, or was it you know oh well, you know I saw as far as I remember, both uh, uh, Planet of the Apes and Poseidon Adventure were instantaneous. I mean, the, it was like an avalanche of success. I think it overwhelmed. Uh, Everybody involved with it. I mean, it just was pow, took off like right off the high diving board. And did it affect, uh, in terms of audience or people's reaction to you? I mean, did, did it? What did it do for your your profile as an actor? Well, that's strange because um, number one, there's a tendency on a lot of of uh, people uh, who are hiring you not to really understand how complex it is to play those roles. And it's strange. For instance, I used to hear a lot of people say in authority, well, we don't need, we can get anybody to play these parts. After all, they're hidden under all this makeup. Of course, that isn't true. Because in order to enhance and override and penetrate through, needs a certain acting uh, adjustment and wisdom. And you can't just stand up there and, no, it doesn't work, because you look like some schlemiel, you know, in a funny suit. Uh, I don't think, I don't think in, in uh, on the commercial end that it led to any particular uh, advancement, you know, uh, because while it might be admired, you still, what are you going to do? You know, how many chimp roles can you play? I mean, if you're thinking that way. On the street, I mean, with audiences, uh, oh yes, to, the, to this day, there's just a huge cult. Uh, the, there was a, this one disturbing aspect, uh, maybe a couple of years later, a, a lot of young girls, you know, I mean, pubescent girls, were absolutely desperately in love with the chimp. And that was discomforting. I mean, not with me, with the chimp. And that used to lead to certain disquieting scenes with uh, the parents of uh, given little girls who were, you know, needed really to be spoken to <laughs> severely. Uh, uh, and it was really uh, a weirdo. That was a weirdo. We have uh, tape change. The, uh, To this day, uh, there is a world of enthusiasm about um, the the Apes series, and it's not like a dead, uh, like musty situation. There's a great vitality about people who still watch those, and I don't mean like they're fanatics. And there's a genuine admiration and and uh, enjoyment from that volume of work that is sort of delightful to witness. Not the lunatic fringe, the, the, the I mean, the, there's a, a, a great, uh, it's wonderful to be a part, it's just simply terrific to have been part of that. Well, what do you think makes it so, so enduring? 
the, the emotions and the ideas are immediately accessible to an audience and appreciated. And uh, it's all wrapped up in the surreal, right? Uh, uh, Do you think that makes it easier to deal with a lot of those issues to sort of mm -hmm. help audiences? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of things can be couched inside uh, those parameters that would become blatant and maybe not as, uh, uh, as forceful without the camouflage. Because there is a lot of satire, in oh. especially the first one. Oh. Hear no evil, speak no evil, see no evil. Uh, uh, I never read an ape I didn't like. Or, uh, uh, I mean, the wonder, wonderful, dear, dear things. Is, and, um, do you recall Although one of, the, one of the great things about Frank Schaffner, I mean, after the fact, when uh, uh, when the language had been set after the first film, you know, one knew the country they went, but to uh, to direct th this material inside this unknown area and have all the actors really not be full of indication or caricature, to have them really uh, relating to each other. Uh, was a difficult, I think, a difficult thing to orchestrate, and he did it wonderfully. Granted, he had terrific people like James Whitmore and Morris Evans, and uh, it was very well cast. But it's still, there's a tendency when you got it that you can go further than uh, discretion should allow, and Frank never fell heir to that. Yeah, that's why I was curious if, I mean, the emotions you're talking about, that they didn't, it's interesting that they didn't, you know, kind of take the Irwin Allen approach to make this, you know, every ape a star kind of a Oh, uh, well, <coughs> the, the uh, Irwin was different. He, he uh, was different. He was a terrific man and, and equally as tenacious uh, in another way as Arthur was. Uh, but Planet of the Apes, that's, an, that's another thing that, uh, that Arthur did. He was looking for actor uh, uh, viability primarily. And he was, I mean, the casting of Morris Evans was wonderful, just the sheer weight and, in, uh, and intangible um, aura of Morris because of what he was made Zaius, uh, uh, it gave him a different potency than perhaps somebody else who didn't have that sort of past in, uh, uh, and that reputation. Not that that was really of legendary content in films, it wasn't, certainly in theater it was, but, but it, it had a yeast to it that was uh, very valuable. Because then, then on the human side, I mean, you have Heston, who has a very strong physical presence. Well, and also, in, in those years, Heston was one of like the five or six uh, biggest stars in, in, uh, in films, and he had a, a, a monolithic, a romantic, uh, a legendary uh, reputation by then, so uh, he was top of the heap, and the, that was uh, that was terrific that he that he did that. Walked into this unknown area, and there's no way you know that one could say, "Oh well, I knew it was going to be, be a big hit." Well, it could have ended up being the most foolish-looking thing on the face of the earth if all the uh, if all the elements hadn't uh, coincided, you know, and, and melded together. It could have been. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> so he was great to work with on the set. That was, you didn't oh, I, I've worked with him before. He's a highly responsible man and, and a, a, very, a, a very giving and supportive comrade in work. He really is. He's a great gentleman to, to work with. The, um, now maybe we could just talk a little bit about the arc of the series past the, the first one. Now you weren't in the second one because... I was directing a film in London. So I wasn't available to be in the second. I'd never seen the second, actually. That was going to be my next question, if you ever saw it. But just no. to see how the kid, you know, because then basically you come into the third one, or, or kind of come back. How did they get you back? I never, you see, I, I never paid, a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of experts, you know, in relation to, are continually trying to rationalize how one gets from one movie to the other. I don't pay attention to that. You know, it's like saying, so Frankenstein came back out, he was buried in ice, and uh, uh, so, okay. Uh, if, if the subsequent 
uh, story is viable on its own terms, okay, you know, uh, it's worth doing. And I thought number three was a terrific story, just wonderful. Um, and full, again, that's Carl then, you know, full of uh, good humor and wry observation and uh, really taking the mickey out of things. Uh, I loved it. I loved the third and the fourth. In the third one, I mean, you, the situation is somewhat reversed. I mean, in that the apes, it's, it's kind of almost like a, tw it's a, basically a twist on the first one. Is it? <laughs> if you say so. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you have, in the first, you have the human come, or coming to the ape world, and then the third one is a reversed, you know, the apes go Have a pie, it's will travel. <laughs> 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 Uh, it made it made great it made perfect sense from beginning to end to me uh, uh, on its own terms. Because yeah, I mean, essentially, in the second one, they painted themselves into a corner a little bit because they destroyed the world, and it was uh, oh that. <laughs> yeah. They destroyed Frankenstein. They destroyed you know. Right. They, you know it, so do you uh, know who? I mean, how how involved was Jacobs in shaping that story arc? You know. I don't know, but I would think immensely because he was as he was into everything. So uh, I'm sure he was. Even, even if he wasn't, you know, like hands-on in that sense, like sitting in the room, he was a catalyst. He knew how to draw, which is, I think, one of the major aspects of being a really good producer. He knew how to assemble uh, elements together, like Arthur Freed did at MGM in musicals. He knew to bring this person before. What is this? What? He knew how to put the ingredients into the soup, and he lit the fire. You know, he, he really was clever that way. And, uh, but I mean, as for sitting down around the table with the pencil and a fool's cap, I don't know. I have no idea. Well, how, how did they get you back for the third one? They just asked. <laughs> no, he asked me, uh, Arthur, well, we were great friends, and he, and he also, he liked my work, which was, uh, which was encouraging. That's nice, you know, be, uh, because actors are disposable objects, you know, and, and uh, a, it's like being a fruit picker, you know, I mean, <laughs> half the season's over, bye-bye. Uh, he, he wanted me to do the second, I remember, he, and he wanted me to come back from London, you know, and do whatever part, uh, but I, I couldn't do that. I was too deeply involved in the project I was working on. He asked me to do the third and the fourth. Now, I get confused about the fifth. Had Arthur died by the time the fifth was made? No, he was still, still he, he was actually um, developing the television show, apparently. Before. Oh, yes, in fact, I did a uh, pilot for him. Right. Oh, yeah, which was disaster. But not his fault, with Stephanie Powers. Of course, we did Topper. And it was a, uh, a wonderful, I forgot, a wonderful script, which the network proceeded to uh, dismember. Uh, and destroyed, and then of course disavowed it and claimed no responsibility. But it was no, it was a very good. That's right. He did two or three television uh, pilots, and they none of them worked. But the network was they were disgraceful toward the material. Oh, yeah. I don't. The fifth. Um, uh, Paul was dead. It was Paul who died. Dane was dead by then, right? Who? Joyce Corrington and John Corrington. Oh. I just remember, and I, the specifics I don't remember, the, the fifth seemed to be uh, bloodless in a, compared to the others. I thought the fourth was full of passion and uh, was sort of marvelous. Now were there, um, I mean in the third one, you were, there were just two apes, so did that, in terms of production time, did that help speed two things apes. along? Well, there was you, you and, and Cornelius. And oh, you mean, oh, apes, no, yeah. chimpanzees. Chimpanzees, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> a chimpanzee is not an ape. <laughs> uh, well, the point is, the moment you had, uh, the moment you had either one of us working, I mean, you were faced, you were lumbered with the hours that had to be eaten up with the makeup. 
and that was all there was to it. That uh, you know, it's like working with a child. You have these given problems to deal with. The child can only work eight hours. Actually, only works three uh, out of the eight-hour day. Um, so those things have to be absorbed, and there's no way to get around it. And any any production manager or uh, anybody in a hierarchy who thinks they they, you know, they need to reassess their their knowledge because that's just it, and you can't do it any other way. When we got to the series, that was a big problem uh, initially, but it seemed to me so because. All you needed then was to really plan very carefully, which was the situation when I was a child. Those movies were so carefully thought out you know, on, on, the, on the boards. And uh, with the exception of the runaway film, they were films were put out in the most uh, responsible manner, the business manner on the board. And with, uh, with the apes, you know, it kept saying, but, you can always have a double for uh, lots of stuff as long as the, the double and I work together, which we did. You know, and, uh, so he knew exactly how I would respond to a, a given long shot doing it while you were being uh, um, repaired or done up or you know, whatever. So there's always a way if uh, the people put their minds to it along the sensible uh, Rules of the game. Now it's the now the third one. Um, yeah. Actually, all of them sort of end on a on a darker note than, than I mean they they weren't traditional Hollywood happy endings. I mean, was that a certain period in cinema history that you think that you could kind of get away with those things and still make popular entertainment? You know, not. not I never fun. thought about it. It seemed you know they it's like. For instance, when Mr. Skeffington was made, uh, Betty Davis, you know, actually, in hindsight, she was so immensely brave to have played it. No woman wanted to play it. The studio didn't really want to do it because it was, quote, unsympathetic. And no woman, you know, all of this stuff went on. And the great thing is it ended up being so empathetic that it made, and her performance was so great that uh, you suddenly were in this operatic, uh, D d quote downbeat situation with a heroine that was impossible, <laughs> but if it works, it works. And downbeat is as it does, you know. I mean, uh, it depends. I never thought. I, I, I don't remember battle very well. I mean, I don't remember. I don't remember the plot or what happened very well. The last one. That is, yeah, that ends on sort of a little bit of an uplifting note of a, you know, it's all, the whole film is basically a flashback. You know, the lawgiver sets up. Oh, was know, it? Caesar oh. at the beginning. John oh. Huston was. Oh, John, 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 the lawgiver, yeah. yeah. The, the thing is that about, there's something resoundingly uh, important and impressive about themes that keep telling us, you know, that if something odd or unknown comes into our society, that for the most part, uh, there's a great wish to destroy it, reduce it, ridicule it. Uh, and that's very moving. Gulliver's Travels, whatever, you know, they, uh, that theme. And you think that was kind of the main theme of the films? Or, or it's part of it. I don't, the main thing, I, I don't know, certainly is, is Part of it, the reluctance of the uh, the stupid and the unjudicious to uh, learn or accept that uh, another point of view about things. Now how about the the transition going from Cornelius to to Caesar? Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> Was there? Uh, I mean. There were, were there weren't were there changes in the makeup to make a different character? You know, no, in fact, I had a huge argument with uh, somebody, some press man who came for an interview, who insisted that there was a difference in the makeup between this was on the fifth film between the third and the fourth, and I said no, there wasn't. It was the same mold and the same. But he went on and on and on ad infinitum, and it was very boring, especially if you're all that stuff trying to rationalize. 
know, that he really hadn't thought it out. And the point is that Caesar is an entirely different uh, hum human chimp, <laughs> human being with, in, uh, with an entirely different lexicon, full of anger, full of uh, 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 hate. And so that naturally made everything appear different. Well, he went on and on and on, and finally I blew up at him and told him that he was, number one, he just wished me to support his preconceived notion. And the fact is, it comes out differently because it's a different character. In fact, there are elements in, in, in the fourth character, I mean, that's like which the third. The, there's a sort of a huge classical tirade in, uh, at the end of that film, as well, which was very difficult to do. That film was very difficult to make because it was shot in Century City, when Century City was at night. And it was a bit like in February, it was bitterly cold. And I think 23 nights in a row, something like that, all night long. And that was dementing for the crew and for, uh, and for the actors, because they were just uh, working at night is difficult anyhow. All night is the invention of the devil. But that role was, that was really a majestic part to play uh, and bore no, uh, hardly any relation to the p parental uh, influences because after all there were none. He'd, uh, he was brought up by Ricardo and uh, Armando, I think it was, his. oh, if I remember that. And so he's a, 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 a re revolutionary uh, a character, you know, on crazed with anger and justifiable bitterness. So, so did you find him to be a, a better character to play than Cornelius? It wasn't better. It just uh, it just very different, and the the requ the, uh, the requirements were on a much bigger canvas than uh, Cornelius. Cornelius is uh, academic, um, uh, charming, uh, sort of polite to a point of being self-effacing, uh, a very responsible, loving father <laughs> uh, and, and husband. But the, the parameters are very, inside those parameters, it's, it's adorable character to play, uh, a very winning personality. But Caesar was, uh, a wild man, absolutely wild, which is great you know, uh, to play. Yeah, I remember uh, there's a shot in the movie that was a tracking shot with you kind of running down Century City, shooting off his machine gun. And I was thinking, you know, Ronnie, this is the first time I think I've ever seen Ronnie McDowell. With <laughs> so, you know, kind of, you know, macho, you know, running down with the. You know, well, that makeup is macho. Yeah, <laughs> it's just so, you know, so physical, which, I mean, to the other. Um. The big problem on the fourth one was that, uh, like on the second day, uh, I hurt myself very badly. Uh, the, uh, those feet were very difficult. They, they were splayed, you know, the, the set pieces, those shoes, and uh, I guess foam. You know, and uh, so the big toe was very dangerous because it could catch in things. And on a dressing room steps court, and uh, my ankle was uh, sprained. And that was very difficult. So I had to shoot it through, full of, it had to be in ice all the time, and shoot it through Nova, Novocaine and stuff like that. And also, one of the weirdest things happened, so it was physically very difficult. There, in the wigs, you know, where the wigs are being put on, you know, the hairpins put in, you know, to, to secure it. And one of the hairpins scratched my scalp. After a while, this huge pain began to uh, assemble. It was just excruciating. It was only, though, when the wig was on. What had happened was that the hairpin, having scraped that, dirt got in, to, and an infection started. And, uh, and you couldn't track it because in without you know, but the moment it would inc it was incubating every time and the wig was on for what 12 13 hours a day and a cyst grew in my head that was I mean of such it was going to scream with pain 
and it grew and it grew very fast. And finally, they had to shut down, um, which they loathed to do. Because, uh, and I had to, it had to be taken out. It was gone for a couple of days, and it was the size of like a great big marble had grown there. And that was very, very painful to deal with. So physically, those things were um, added problems that you really didn't want to have to deal with because the part was exhausting. The uh, level of energy it needed to play uh, Caesar was entirely different than. Um, than Cornelius. Now in the in the last film, actually, the character goes becomes more of a pacifist. Did you Does he? <laughs> uh, okay. I mean, I don't. Know. I just yeah, remember. I, mean I remember the aspects that really appealed to me as an actor, and then they and the, see the fifth character. Uh, that's Caesar's too. Yeah, right? it's also Caesar's. See, I don't. I I don't really remember much about uh, battle, except it did seem not to have any, in, in the material, it seemed to have no real, uh, that I can remember, excitement or, or grip to it. Uh, I loved working with Lee again, and everybody, everybody was terrific, but it didn't seem to have, uh, in my memory, any particular uh, scenario credit. Uh, On the series, however, I loved it, because I got to play a lot of different characters. I remember one time, we only did 13, I wish we'd known. I, one time, we had great, great producers on I loved them. Do you know how the, the series was developed, you know, uh, coming off the I do know that the series was, uh, the head of the network, uh, for some reason, I don't think he was partial to chimpanzees. I don't think that he really wanted to invite any of them to his house for dinner. And as I recall, the series, when I went on the air without a pilot, Mrs. Paley wanted on the air, and so it went on the air. And the controlling influences about programming felt that, th th this is my view of it, understand, uh, that the monkeys were not interesting and it should have to do with the astronauts. Well, that seemed to be a Montessori approach to the idea because, after all, the great thing about Planet of the Apes were the monkeys. That's why everybody was rushing toward this, as audience, toward this material. So that was difficult to deal with because uh, he had it upside down. You know, uh, and it, that was detrimental to his pro. It began to switch around to deal with what it had to do, which is the adventures of the two astronauts in, a, in an alien world that was monkey controlled, you know, and, and uh, those adventures. And in, in a sense, they were not the uh, driving forces. The great fun was that in the series, as it went on, I remember one time I said I would love to uh, do a theme that was a thinly disguised Scarlet Pimpernel, chimp, you know, and we did it. And I remember sort of playing the, uh, the, the character sort of, the character inside the character, sort of like Rex Harrison. Well, that, of course, isn't recognizable because you're in chimp drag. But I mean, it was great fun to do the One time, I remember uh, in one sketch, I, I was a, a chimp lady. <laughs> and those were, those were wonderful fun to do and f full of um, uh, larkiness. It was, that was good. But the view of the network toward the material didn't seem to be the most intelligent, and it didn't seem to be based in any sort of understanding of what the uh, of why this, the feature films had been successful. And to me, it's blatantly obvious, you know, that because uh, yeah, the concept was changed because you had humans when they came to the planet, the humans weren't brutes; they were articulate, and and so the whole dynamic of the ape society and the human society was different from the series. Do you, I mean, from the film series, do you, do you know why those, that decision, that creative decision was made to do that? Well, I don't know because I, <coughs> I don't know those gentlemen, but it was, <coughs> it was what you call it, a, <coughs> a dead issue, really from before the fact, because the network uh, programming people did not want it or given e elements of that, did not want it. Well, how about getting you involved in the series? Who, who approached you? And I asked them. I mean, it was, uh, 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 there was, 
initially, no, uh, they didn't come to me about it at all. Arthur was, uh, Arthur was my uh, champion in relation to uh, the films, and he believed there was a difference in the performances if I played them, which was very encouraging of him. But when he was gone, there was nobody that said, oh, well, we must have Roddy McDowell for the series. Uh, I think they would have taken your Uncle Fred, you know, the, uh, uh, because those initial network, uh, that, that initial network power didn't have an understanding of what the ingredients were. Now, they may dispute, or if anybody wants, they may dispute and say, oh, that's not true. And that, but that was the truth. I, uh, I went to them and said I wanted to play it which cost me dearly, because if you go and you say you want to play something, then you are, uh, you're dealt with monetarily on an, from an entirely different power base. Uh, in fact, you've very small power base. <laughs> and, uh, but that's the truth. They didn't want me. And which is all right. I got to play it. What about the, the other actors that you worked with on the show? You had oh, well, Jimmy Norton, uh, uh, we are very close friends. Ron, I don't know that that well, and it was it was wonderful working with him. And, uh, Jimmy Norton is, uh, of course, has an extraordinary career and is a very versatile. His whole family, I mean, we're very close friends. Thank God. Ron, I, I haven't seen since then. He's a nice man. So, so but it was a good it, it was a good working partnership. So, were you, did you feel the show was a creative success and it was more politics? Of I thought the show was, we were, we were get, beginning to hit the time when it's 1971, is it? Uh, yeah, uh, 72. 72. When, you know, before that, years beforehand, when you were going to do a series, usually at least half of the scripts had been written, you know, or more than half, to do with a given season. And that was, uh, that was an intelligent uh, way to go about that. By this time, things were, oh, well, we do this, we do that, you know, and that, uh, uh, there was a lack of, of, uh, of planning. And I, it's just my, with a wonderful uh, studio uh, producing team, they were terrific. But uh, they were up against what I thought was a network uh, uh, disinterest and negligence which at the same time had, could not appear to, on the table. So uh, it was sort of a hypocritical thing, oh yes, we love it, and so on and so forth. And, uh, but the proof of the pudding wa was that they didn't. And it was dead from, it was dead in the water before the fact, but that was not plied. I thought what was happening at the end, uh, as we came toward the end of the, f the first 13, that it was really beginning to find its legs, which that's the thing that happens with series. You've got to find out the territory you're in, you know, and, and the balance. But it was dead then, and they, they froze it, because I think another network wanted it, but they, they froze it dead and said, no, it's just going in for re rehab or whatever, what, what, uh, to be reassessed. But it wasn't, it was dead one year. But those things, you know, that's, uh, that's like this. You can't really, you can never prove it because uh, that was it. Just a quick take. Can we yes? go back to say his name in the word out? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right, right, <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that just, might work to be a, Well, actually, kind of coming off that a little bit, there's, when, when Apes was, was um, the first movie was created, or in production, I mean, was there this thought of, of kind of creating a franchise, you know, that's become the kind of popular term these days, and was that as common back then to try to, you know, oh, we gotta, we got to make a movie that's going to make us, so we can make five more? And no. I mean, as far as I know, there was, we're just making the movie. Uh, but then I think that was about the second and the third. You see, the, all those, those things happen after the fact, you know. Oh, well, like when I was making My Friend Flicker, there was no concept of making Thunderhead, the sequel. And when we making Thunderhead, there was no concept of the third, which I wasn't in. <laughs> uh, it doesn't happen like that. Uh, you you go, really go, unless you've been, uh, I suppose, I don't think even the Andy, uh, the Andy Hardy things, I think they probably knew, the, but they never knew the, the length, how long is a piece of string. 
the commercialization, you mean the, um, the products that came? I know when we came to doing the series, they announced the biggest merchandising uh, uh, issue that had ever been up until that time. So much so, I thought I went on strike because it was an after the fact, and they bragged about it. But and there had to be a little, a little reassessment going on, and that was huge. In fact, that was so successful. I'm not certain that. With good thinking, they couldn't possibly have. Um, what's the word when you finance something out of uh, sub? Oh, what's that word? Uh, deficit. Uh, uh, I'm not certain that they couldn't have uh, subsidized the series, uh, which was the most expensive series I think up until that time. You know, all the uh, pittance now by comparison. But that merchandising was, of course, fantastic. And Planet of the Apes was a huge uh, success in that area. Huge. Was was the series past the first one consciously marketed toward kids? Do you think? I beg your pardon. Was the series past the first one consciously marketed toward kids? Do you think? I don't know. I, I suppose. I mean, I don't know. I, it would be irresponsible. It seems common sense to think that it would be, though. Well, the kids went back. Time and time. I think there are some 70 year old people that are still going back. <laughs> <laughs> Is, um, I, I guess, in the first one, are, are there any, the first film, do are there any kind of specific anecdotes you remember beyond any of the things that you've told us? Any kind of other little adventures with the, uh, the chimpanzee makeup or? Not past the one, I'm sure there are, but, but the ones that just came off the top of my head. But I, I found it sort of really <laughs> full of salsa to be able to, you know, when you, when, that nobody knew who you were. If you walk around the, 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 the lot as a chimpanzee, you could go and go, <laughs> right. yeah, highly insulted because they didn't know who was doing it. <laughs> so it's like, oh, yes, really just out of school, you know, playing hooky. <laughs> shot a lot of exterior stuff hmm. around Beverly Hills and all that in, in full makeup was for the Beverly we, we shot in the Beverly Wilshire Hotel remember and uh, but in those incidents you know when you you're all made up you're dressed and you and the work has to be that you're you're not really open to too much more than doing the work at hand because it is so c concentrated and difficult especially on existing locations uh, with that in that situation. I remember uh, Kim in the bubble bath, right, that was in the, <laughs> in the Beverly Wilshire. And, it was, and that was very difficult to do because uh, the heat and being in a confined space. And uh, But it was fun. That was a fun movie to make. It was very enjoyable. But some of those exterior things where you were out in public, did, was there a reaction from the crowd? There always was a reaction from, like I talked about, you know, about uh, like I do know how the animal feels in a zoo, because that because it, it isn't like people are saying, "Oh, look, there's Roddy McDowell." It's like, "Oh, oh, oh," because they don't know what it is. It's just, "Oh, look, oh, 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 oh," you know, they're being poked at. No, not actually, you know, but I mean, so uh, you're a thing. I found that interesting, very interesting. Now you had mentioned before too about Arthur um, kind of being your champion. Do, do you do you feel that you were integral? to the series success, and, and did Arthur sort of say, you know, we I don't, uh, uh, I, I don't have a perspective. Uh, I don't think any actor understands his personality or his persona, because that's, you know, any more than we understand uh, the sound of our own voice. I mean, when you hear the sound of your voice, aren't you appalled? Because it doesn't sound the same. That's the same way visually. So I don't think one has a correct perspective about themselves. I mean, you can say, well, I think I'm an intelligent and talented and, and uh, uh, con uh, uh, responsible actor, but somebody else has to hire you before you can put that on the table. And Arthur, Arthur liked what I did, and that was nice because he was in a position to hire me or persuade people to hire me. And 
that. I appreciate it. <laughs> but we never t talked about anything about this can't be with uh, this, you have to be this. You know, it was never anything like that. Uh, uh, because, of course, a lot of people could have played Cornelius. Uh, there are dozens of actors who can uh, play the same role, or maybe only half a dozen. <laughs> but there are, you know, so one is always uh, re replaceable in that sense, and it's nice to have somebody who believes in you say, yeah, I think you should be doing that. Which isn't just lip service, I mean, it uh, steps up to the mark of what he believes. And when he, when he passed away, do you recall the circumstances and, and sort of your emotions at the time? Well, it uh, was very sad because Arthur was a, a friend and a unique. And uh, I mean, if we'd, never been in, if we'd never been in business together, he just was such a, 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 a breath of, of inventive air. I mean, he was, <laughs> he was delicious and he was sort of outrageous. In the, in a very nice sense, he he heard a different sound to things, and and he had a great good time in life. He, one knew that uh, not that his days were numbered, but he was fragile because he had um, a heart condition, and he was so volatile, you know. Uh, so it, w in that sense, it it wasn't unexpected that something that like that might happen. It was highly regrettable. And he was a good friend, and he was he was kind to people. And he's from a he's from a line of uh, of film enthusiasts and uh, high line, you know, uh, uh, well, PR and producers. They don't exist anymore that way. He, uh, he was he was fuck. How did, do you recall how he sort of came up in front of, into the producing ranks? Or? No, I don't. I don't because uh, uh, he was always, in my consciousness, he was always around. Was he was, uh, was he was, uh, uh, ca ca uh, Warren Cowan, what, Arthur Jacobs, he had his own firm, didn't he? Uh, a PR firm? Yeah. But I forget the, I forget all the particulars of that. But. Uh, and I forget the first film he produced, but he was a good producer. I mean, the, the other films, what was the one uh, with uh, Played Against Sam? It was his, wasn't it? Yeah. I don't, I don't think it was. I, I know he had Dr. Doolittle behind the screen. No, before, uh, played, I think Played Against Sam was, uh, and I think, uh, and, uh, and he was very adventurous. I mean, what the films that, Let's say they didn't work, you know. I mean, or didn't. Uh, I, uh, the reason there's do little as Tom Sawyer was as the last. But he look at Jodie Foster, you know. And, uh, <laughs> but he had, he had big ideas, you know. He had really sensational ideas. Sometimes they worked, sometimes they didn't. But it's the same with everything. I think he did play it against. Him. He did play it against him. Was the and when you were filming them, did, was it ever the thought that this was going to be the last one? We're not going to do another one. Which? Any of the films, so, as they kept progressing, like when you did well, the third one. Oh, I hope we don't do a fourth. No, one. I know. Well, I never think that way. So uh, the primary thing I think when a project is coming in is, is the old. I will never work again. <laughs> that's the, you know, that's the major. I will never have another job. Uh, but I, and I don't mean that in a paranoid way to say, oh, yeah, well, that's one of the staples that you know, that's on the table, never working in. I used to worry about that until till Henry Fonda revealed that he had exactly the same, and he's a, one of the best actors I ever saw, exactly the same disease. But I never thought, uh, I never thought fur further than the uh, content of the piece of work one was involved with. No. So when you were doing No, all I remember about the fifth one is that I didn't feel that it'd be interesting to ask uh, Jay Lee. Um, I didn't think it had the uh, the grit or a measure of the other material. 
but that didn't mean that, I mean, I'd continually thought that there should be another one, continually. Seems impossible that 30 years have gone by and there hasn't been. So would you do a sequel? Would depend on, number one, if I was asked, and number two, what the content happened to be. There's no reason to do one just for the sake of, of, of doing one. And, uh, They're going to bomb us. I'm hearing a clicking sound too. I don't know if it's a chair or. It's somebody trying to work their way out of jail. Yeah, the the Count of Monte Cristo. Okay, I think we're clear. Um, oh, that was a question. Oh, would you, well, would you do a sequel? Oh, it would depend on whether the material was viable. Um, there's no reason to do one for the sake of doing one. But I know there have been some very good ideas down through the years that um, haven't been entertained. By my, uh, I don't know why they've never. I, I guess marketing says, you know. But then certainly the idea of making features of, of Star Trek was, uh, those things were tabled for years, you know, and then look. You know, oh. well, would you rather do a sequel or, or, or a remake? Oh, I think a remake is the most ridiculous idea on the face of the earth. I mean, categorically, that is, uh, why do a sequel? Number, in, number one, the original film was brilliantly made. Number two, we know the opening surprise and the end is one of the classic moments of, uh, of film invention. And even if people haven't seen it, it's one of those subliminals, you know, it's somewhere in the consciousness. It's been spoken of so often, or the clips are. So the end it just blew you, uh, you out of your seat. You know, the, uh, it would be silly to do. To mount, you know, what, however many millions, $80 million to do the same thing. You can't do it better than that. That was fine. No. Do, do uh, an, a, a sequel, another var a variation. A sequel, I mean. That's the, you know, the apes in Waikiki, or <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, the yeah. apes visit Ma and Pa Kettle. Remember Abbott Costello? You visit Frankenstein or uh, Captain Kidd. <laughs> I just. <laughs> they were talking, talking about Alien versus Predator for a while. Like, uh, why not bring the apes up again? That's what the movie was missing. Marjorie Mays. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Sandra D. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The apes go Hawaiian. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, what's that? Tab Hunter. Tab Hunter, right? Falling for zero. <laughs> um, I think I think that's pretty much pretty much covers us. Um, okay. Is there anything that you can think of, Brian? The, I would rather not do the physicalization thing uh, today. I'd rather, I mean, if when we do that, if you want me to wear the same uh, clothes, remind me, I mean, whatever. Uh, but it is I think it's important and sort of kicky to see how that evolved physically. Yeah, I think that's definitely something we want to bring out in the, uh, in the, sh in the special, because it's such an integral part of the whole ape performance beyond just, you know, the prosthetic stuff. Mm -hmm. The walking, and mm -hmm. it's, it's really a, a lot of, uh, you could just see that there was a lot of thought put into that, you know, the whole Well, it wouldn't whole, work. Whole I, it didn't, you couldn't get a word, strange enough, you couldn't get a word out without having, uh, without having a home that it came from that seemed logical. And uh, that's one of the great things uh, about being an actor when you, uh, uh, have a, the opportunity to play something that is really totally original. Because after all, one wasn't playing a chimpanzee, one was playing an evolved uh, creature that had those beginnings. There. So uh, it wasn't, you, you could go and sit in the zoo for as long as you wanted, you weren't playing that. You were playing something that had matured into some other um, expression. And reaching that decision 
was a, a, a fascinating journey, and that's I don't know, and, and gives you sort of the the joy of being in the line of business you're in, because it needs it it it, it, it hasn't been graphed before. You can't find it in a book. You have to think it up. So you were breaking new ground in, in a lot of ways. Well, yeah, and because it's a collective form, it, you can't do it in a vacuum. You, it has to be uh, agreed upon and embraced and supported. Because there's nothing worse if you think than if you, as an actor, think of an idea that is uh, bizarre. Uh, or, or if it becomes bizarre because it, it, it isn't accepted. Uh, then you're out, you know, out on a limb all alone. Like, for instance, uh, uh, Dustin Hoffman, when he played Tootsie, I've never spoken to him about it, but that's an extraordinary invention, that character. Because removed from the experience of seeing it, he's not a believable woman. However, a lot of women we know are not believable women. And that's what's so great, because you can believe anything as long as the person playing it believes it. And what he did was absolutely brilliant, absolutely wonderful, like Jack Lemmon's creation in, in uh, Some Like It Hot, you know, where he doesn't want to be the girl and then suddenly takes off, like Charlie's that, you know, girl's got to think of a future, you know, I mean, it's inc incredible. That's because the actor believes and has found some release in uh, uh, climbing inside uh, the parameters of the c character he's created. But that's no good if the director isn't there supporting and honing and gardening what you're doing. And that's why Schaffner was, I mean, personally, is such a, a terrific guy to work with, because he could have shot it down like that, and one would have been, you know, you know, wouldn't have been able to function. Well, did you get that same thing from the other directors in the series? Well, by the time, once it was set, once Planet of the Apes came out, I mean, Nobody even questioned that was the norm. Nobody even, until this time now, uh, in, uh, in, a, in a larger, this, I've never expressed this. I spoke about it with, uh, with Frank, how grateful it was that he uh, was so quietly supportive about it. After that, it just was the norm. Before the fact, it was... Uh, where nobody even questioned, nobody even thought about it. They didn't think about it, put it, put it in the script of what the physicalization was. So and the other directors were just, he knows what he's doing, let him pass. Well, I don't know, it was never even, I don't know, because it was never discussed. Uh, I suppose, uh, for instance, if, if, uh, if a ballet has been created and a given dancer has, uh, been choreographed, I don't know, by Balanchine or Baryshnikov or whatever, and then that's the set, then uh, expression of that, then another cast comes in to do it, and it, is, it isn't even questioned until maybe 10 or 15 years later when another choreographer gives a different interpretation of that material. But it, it just is, uh, that's the way it is. So, but so from film to film, though, would you have to coach the new people playing apes, or, or was it? No, it wasn't. I, I it never coached anybody, uh, really. It just was, and I don't know what Frank did. Maybe Kim would remember if. Uh, all I remember is saying that we can't do this unless all the other chimpanzees are some variation of it, because we'll look like we came from another country. Um, It was, it was, and also the other, the, there were a great many, there were, there were a lot of masks, not everybody, I forget how, the, only the principals or the people playing sport were uh, uh, applianced. There were a lot of people just had masks on, just big rubber heads. And uh, that had to be very, you know, they were blacked here, you know, sort of, <laughs> but that uh, had to be carefully dealt with by the assistants and, and the director so that those so that those images wouldn't be blatantly unreal. I mean, all of that had to be dealt with. Very interesting, very interesting assignment for everybody. And no one handled it, handled it particular, particularly differently than 
one director didn't handle it differently than another? I don't know. Because Frank was the first, he was a, a breaking new territory, and that's why I was, well, as years go on, in, in more awe of him, because he never panicked. And all the ingredients were uh, mind-boggling to deal with. And he said, he never seemed flustered. Sure, yeah. Get bars up for us. Bars are up. It's uh, 30 seconds of room tone. 